Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant James Mansfield. Today, we bring you another in our series of the big picture, devoted to telling the story of the combat infantryman, the soldier who wears the blue badge. We are going to show you the toughest 10 days of fighting in the whole New Guinea campaign of World War II. And we're going to bring you the men who fought there, the prized 6th Infantry Division. Later on in the program, Colonel Quinn will have a special interview with a captured Chinese communist soldier, the sort of Chinese communist we use at the intelligence school for training officers in prisoner interrogation. So now to tell you more about our program, we take you to the office of Colonel William W. Quinn. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This week we have a most unusual program. It's an interview, an interview with a Chinese communist soldier we're going to find out, I'm sure, quite a lot about communist philosophy and logic. Beforehand, however, we'd like to show you a living history of a great American division. The old sunset are the sightseeing six. Hiya, Sarge. Hiya, fellas. In a few minutes, I'll have an anniversary. Four years with a division. A lot has happened in four years. For one thing, new faces have come into the outfit. Only a few of us now remember the faces that haven't been around for a while. Faces that go back two, three, or even four years. You know, in World War I, our outfit tramped all over France. Got the name Sightseeing Six. And we got around a little in World War II. How about some singing? Okay. What do you want? Got something about Hawaii? Hey, that's for me. A hula dance is a pretty sight to see. Soldier and a hula girl is nice beside the sea. Yes, the six had a good look at Hawaii. But when we shipped out, it wasn't only hula girls we were leaving. Oahu was amphibious training, plenty of it. And we didn't mind leaving. We had talked about the war, we were trained for it. Now we had to get moving. Going over, we thought it was going to be Australia, but it turned out to be New Guinea, Milne Bay. Sing strong and free. One, two, three, four. 
Beautiful New Guinea, rich golden sunsets, tall palm trees with coconuts, all you can eat, and fine California weather, day after day. So this was home. Started to set up housekeeping and meet the neighbors. It was a pretty comfortable routine. If this was life in the Southwest Pacific, wasn't as bad as they said it was going to be. But after a while, the usual thing happened. Somebody remembered our name, the sightseeing six, and we had to move again. We had just gotten nicely set up in our jungle home when we were involved in a trip up the coast to Maffin Bay. It was a routine move. We wouldn't go in fighting. But when they put rations in our hands and said we'd occupy defense positions, we started thinking. Didn't take long to find out. Two days later, that first battle. First, we were walking. Then, creeping. A lot of the time, we were hugging Mother Earth. And then we hit the Jap jackpot. Lone Tree Hill. The silliest name for a hill you ever heard of. The six hit the bloodiest 10 days the New Guinea campaign. It was the first time we smelled Japs. First time we saw our own buddies killed. We kept pushing. We grunted up that hill. The closer to the top, the hotter it got. We took Lone Tree Hill. The men who fought there weren't out to become heroes. They just wanted to do their job, wanted to get it over with. There's something else to remember about Maffin Bay. Our base area was built on a solid foundation of mud. Whatever the new job was, we had been baptized. Some of us had a chance for a last dip before leaving. We'd done some fighting. We were off on another job. We couldn't help feeling like seasoned troops. Next step, way out on the western tip of New Guinea, Sansapar. While the Amtraks took two small islands off the beach, the rest of us drove toward the mainland. It was a cool gray dawn, a little quiet, and very wet. There was no opposition. What were we here for? Then the picture got clearer. We weren't looking for a fight. Our mission in San Sephora was to gain an airstrip. We did it businesslike. First to Beachhead, then up the coast to secure our right flank. A walk down the coast on our left flank. Some Japs in the area, retreating. We cut them off. Right and left flanks accounted for. We controlled Sansapor. All this time, the engineers were busy. They started working on that strip the day we got ashore. There was an airstrip on Sansapor in record time. Soon, the flyboys were getting the lowdown on their first mission. 
Colonel Spencer told you that this is our first mission out of San Spor. The 69th will lead, the 7th attached. Takeoff will be at 0940. We'll be over the target at 12 o'clock. We'll go from San Spor to Dampier Strait and then direct to the target. You have two squadrons, and they'll go down and strafe after they fly cover for you to the target. San Sapor was paying off. The Air Force was striking at Borneo and up toward the Philippines. And there was something else in the air, an atmosphere of something big about to happen. We got little talks about things to come, stuff to think about. Then came the loading. Every day the job was loading. More and more LSTs pulled up to the beach. Day after day, we moved in the stuff for our next battle. Finally, the ships were jam-packed. We were getting ready for the biggest thing in the Pacific, the Philippines. San Sapor wound up the New Guinea campaign. The victory was duly recorded, and the sightseers set sail from beautiful New Guinea, paradise of the Southwest Pacific, hoping never to return again. Whatever was coming, there was one thing we had behind us. The sightseeing six had been together for a long time. In one briefing after another, they gave us the details. Lady had been invaded. We were going to bite off a bigger chunk of the Philippines, Luzon and Manila. The Japs got desperate. They tried to head us off with kamikaze. But no Jap kamikazes or anything else were going to stop us from landing at Lingayen Gulf. Before the attack, an evening like any other evening in the tropics, beautiful sky, Peaceful. This was ours coming up, the long battle for Luzon. Funny looking back on the first few days, not much trouble. The Japs just seemed to have left town. But the Japs were pretty close, just off our left flank. They were out to blast our beachhead. Silence those guns. One of our combat teams went into the hills. They call it the Purple Heart Valley Campaign. Started seeing casualties, old friends. Got those Jap guns, and the stuff kept rolling ashore. Luzon campaign was off to a start. The rest of the division was moving down the Central Plains area, easy going until the Japs started playing games, hide and seek, with us out in the open and them having all the hiding places in the Cameroon Hills.
On the way south, there was one little town being softened up for us by airstrikes, a town called Munoz. When we got to the town, it seemed to be asleep or dead. No activity. Then Jap tanks and infantry. The first blow made us duck. But we hit back. No luck. So we slipped around to the back door and opened without knocking. The nips were trapped. One night they tried to pull out. We had tanks and heavy guns lined up along the highway waiting. Just waiting for this. We ran out to take a look. We had knocked out the biggest collection of Jap armor ever encountered. You can say this about the sightseers. Give them a job, anything, any place, they'll do it. Drive across Luzon, split the Japs in half, check. Drive to Batan, check. Crack the Shimbu line, well, that one can't be checked off so quick. With Manila taken by the 1st Cavalry and the 37th Division, the danger came now from the mountains east of the city. The Japs were high up again and behind the Shimbu line. It was down into the valley and up the hill. Again, one damn hill after the other. gave plenty, and got plenty. Around those mountains, you felt like a walking target. The Japs always had perfect observation. approach was knocking us out. We decided to set out on a new tack. About those hills, Banzai Hill, for example, they had to be taken all the way to the top and then all the way down the other side. And after every hill, a counterattack. You could depend on it. Well, after 112 days of this stuff, we cracked the Shimbo line. We were pulled out for a rest, but some jobs came up. MP work in Manila, check. Guarding highways, check. Mop up the central Luzon area, check. A nice rest. We came back from the rest to watch the Air Force burning out a trail for us into the north. We went after General Yamashita and his Imperial Jap headquarters. Just follow Highway 4. Highway 4, especially those days, was not a good highway. There weren't any speed laws, but you just couldn't make any time. Highway 4 was a lousy highway. It took us right into the jungle. We had been here before. This was New Guinea country. Yep, this was New Guinea, right down to the rain. The 6th Division had an answer to the jungle supply problem. Hard work. The country changed. We got closer to Imperial Jap headquarters. In this position, the sightseers didn't see much country. The 
fighting was getting tougher. We kept moving forward, cave by cave. General Yamashita had his back to the wall in northern Luzon. The 6th was poised for the final push when the Japanese Empire surrendered. But the word was slow getting around to the Japs. So at the end of the war, the sightseers were the most heavily engaged troops in the United States Army. We didn't get to take part in any formal surrenders. Our outfit had another mission. We were pulled out of the lines and sent to Korea. So here we are. I wouldn't be in another outfit. sure what's going to come out of this interview with this uh, Chinese communist soldier, but uh, let's find out. What's your name? My name Hong Yi. Where are you from? Me from Harbin, Montreal. That's your home? Yeah, my home. Well, uh, how long have you been uh, in the Chinese army? I'm in the army for five years. Uh, you've been a private all that time? Private all the time. Uh, are you a communist? Me a good communist, yes. Well, uh, why? Reason for communists is because they give me lots of promise. They give me safety for my family. Who, uh, who promises you all this? Oh, big man. Oh, big man. Huh? Yeah, big man. Well, uh, how about the uh, fact that uh, don't you realize that uh, you're the victim of Chinese... Uh, uh, propaganda? Me Com victim? Communist propaganda. Me victim? No. You're a victim. Oh, I'm a victim. Yeah, you're I a victim. See. Well, uh, in other words, I don't know the truth. You don't know the truth. Me know everything. They tell us everything. Look, <clears throat> I, we're not getting anywhere, but I want to ask you this one question. Why do you stupidly stay in your foxholes and trenches when you can see the American infantry coming? The sad world, um, American capitalist uh, Wall Street. Have you ever been on Wall Street? Me no want to go Wall Street. Why don't you? Uh, not safe. Not safe. Well, who's going to hurt you? Oh, everybody, come get my money away. Family not safe. Oh, I see. Well, is that the only reason you won't stay in your foxhole? Or that you do stay in your foxhole? No. Commissar tell us to stay there. Who's he? He a big man. Well, uh, he's a big man. What is he in your battalion? No, he be a big, big, big man. Oh, I see. Now, he's going to make you stay in your foxhole. Suppose you don't stay in your foxhole. What, what's going to happen to you? Me no stay in, he chop my neck off. Well, you finally made a little sense there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, that last aspect is real motivation that uh, off of the neck proposition. What what kind of uniform is that? That's a winter uniform, I guess. Yeah. What What's it made of? Good cotton padding. Very good uniform, warm. All the uh, communists got good uniform. Oh, I see. Is that made in China? Yeah, made in Manchuria. Oh, Manchuria. Oh, I see. Where do, well, where does your uh, rifle come from in your bullets? Where do they come from? Oh, good friend, uh, Soviet Russia give us equipment. Oh, they're your great ally, is that right? Yeah, good friend. I see. Do, do the Russians give you plenty of supplies and equipment? Yeah, they give us plenty, plenty supply. Why? Oh, to fight American warmongers. Oh, I see, we're warmongers again. Look, when you go into uh, a fight, when you go into battle, 
Uh, what what do you carry uh, besides your rifle? Rice bag and fish to eat. Rice bag and fish. Yeah. Uh, don't you carry any medical supplies or anything when you go into attack? Don't need them. Oh, you don't need them. No. I see. Well, you're just a private anyway. You wouldn't know, would you? Mm, I don't know. Now look, when you do go into battle, and when you are in there fighting, and, and you run out of food and ammunition, how do you get, uh, how are you resupplied? Do people bring it up to you? My friend died there, my friend died here. They don't, they don't have use. Me take them. Oh, I see, you take them. You rob the dead on the field of battle, is that right? They don't have use. Me take them. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. The commie logic goes on and on. Makes no reason, makes no sense. But in any event, today and now, I want to introduce to you the star of our communist soldier plot, if you will, Sergeant Kim, United States Army. Sergeant, thanks a lot for being with us. It's been a pleasure to be able to do my part, we, sir. You don't know how much we appreciate your taking such a uh, poor part, but I must say convincing. Incidentally, uh, Sergeant, um, what is your hometown? My hometown is in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Well, thanks again for being with us, and uh, I hope that you don't have to take this kind of part anymore. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, that's about it for today, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you would drop in on us next week when we tell you the story about the 34th Division in Europe. We're also going to tell you about the United States Family of Medals for Heroism and a great number of many interesting sidelights on the Congressional Medal of Honor. So until we meet again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Colonel Quinn speaking for the combat infantrymen who ask you to look twice at the man who wears the blue badge. It's the mark of a man. The Big Picture is a weekly television report.